Brother Mike, I do appreciate the prayers of the saints. Our theme for the renewal this year, you know, is the exalted Christ. <clears throat> In my text is 1 Peter 3.22, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. <clears throat> You know, to be exalted, first you, you have to consider that at one point you had to be low first. You can't, if you're already as high up as you can possibly go, well, you can't be exalted any higher. So when, when we're speaking of Christ being exalted, it's, it's assumed that at some point he was low. <clears throat> you know, in, uh, you consider Christ, no one else has ever had the range that Christ has had. He started at the highest and he went down to the lowest and he went back up to the highest again. <clears throat> but now this, this ascending back up to the highest exaltation, it, the word is different from just ascending. Now Christ did ascend but he was exalted. Amen. It's Amen. different. It's different this time. Now, in the, you know, First Peter, Peter's first epistle, the main theme that keeps coming up here is suffering, in particular, suffering for the sake of Christ, or as Peter says, suffering for well-doing. <clears throat> it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. I'm not given to telling stories much, but <clears throat> a few months ago, I, was, I went to the grocery store to get some things, and I was in my car uh, driving down the parking aisles, the parking rows there looking for a place to park, and uh, a woman was walking across, and apparently she assumed that I was going to stop and let her cross in front of me, and I, I didn't, whether I... I, for whatever reason, I wasn't trying to be rude. I just figured we were out in the parking lot. She should know a, a car was moving. But anyway, nevertheless, that's beside the point. As I drove past, she, she cursed at me, called me a rotten name. And I, that really upset me. That just ruffled my feathers, so to speak. So much, seriously, now it, it actually took me several days to get over that. We're talking about a segment of my life, we're talking about four or five seconds here. And it took me days to get over it. It kept coming up in my mind, it just was so abrasive to my spirit. It took a long time to get over it. Now, how easy do you think it was for Jesus to get over the cross? He who knew no sin was made to be sin. All we, like sheep, had gone astray. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was made to be the propitiation for the sins of the whole world. Do you think it was easy for Jesus to get over that? Do you think he just brushed it off? He was put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Now Peter here, he's talking about, Part of what he's talking about is Jesus' bodily resurrection from the dead, but that's not all he's talking about. <clears throat> he was put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Some of you, you who are preachers, or even if you're not a preacher, if you've discovered you'll have times of great difficulty in this life, and you'll have pockets of time where it's really concentrated, <clears throat> where you're maybe... Perhaps there's turmoil in the home, turmoil at work, maybe even turmoil in the assembly, maybe health problems, financial problems, maybe all these things even come on you all at once and it seems like you're being delivered unto death and you're, you're perplexed, you don't know which way to turn and you're scheduled to preach this Sunday, by the way. If the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. And I say, wait a minute now. He, Peter's talking about the resurrection of the dead. He is, but he's talking about more than that. <clears throat> Christ was put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the spirit, by the which 
by which what? By the Spirit, or by the quickening of the Spirit, he went and preached to the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. This is before his body came out of the tomb. Jesus was quickened before his body came out, and he, here after his death, he descends further. He, he descends down to the abode of the spirits. King James Version calls it hell, but we're not talking about the lake of fire here. We're talking about where, where the spirits are. And it, don't miss my point here. Let me back up a little bit just so I don't lose anyone. The context is suffering for well-doing. Peter's giving us the prime example, Jesus Christ, immediately following his crucifixion for the sins of the world, he's got a preaching appointment. Quickened by the spirit he was to do this. He descended down and preached to those spirits in prison. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> Peter also says here, for as much you know that the context is suffering because he continues on in chapter 4. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. So even throughout the rest of the third chapter where my text is and into the fourth chapter, he's still talking about suffering. But then he says... When Jesus preached to these spirits in, in prison, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah when the ark was a preparing, wherein a few, that is, eight souls were saved by water, the like figure whereunto baptism doth also now save us. Not putting away the filth of the flesh, but a good answer, a good conscience toward God, that's in parentheses, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now let me say it without the parentheses. The like figure whereunto baptism doth also now save us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now it seems that Peter, on the surface it seems like maybe he changed the subject, but no he didn't. This is all one continuous thought. Well, I'm talking about exaltation here. Christ went down as low as any man could go. And he was quickened by the Spirit. And we see his exaltation begin here where he's preaching to spirits in prison. Peter's connecting all these things together. You're connected with Christ by your suffering. Christ preached to these spirits in prison. We don't have any more information than that. How many of them believed? We don't know, but we'll meet them. And that's connected to those, were the, the, those who were sometime disobedient in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. Noah didn't die in the flood. He was saved in the ark by the water. The water is a like figure whereunto baptism saves you and I by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All these, all these things are connected together to Christ's resurrection, to his, his being quickened and exalted after his suffering. That's what Peter, Peter's connecting all this to the suffering of Christ. <clears throat> it's wonderful to see that. Our suffering for well-doing is connected to Jesus, the ultimate example of suffering for well-doing. Jesus is connected to the Spirit who quickened him after his suffering, demonstrated by his preaching to the spirits in prison. These spirits in prison are connected to Noah because they were disobedient when Noah was building the ark. Noah and the ark are connected to baptism, and our baptism connects us with Jesus Christ. <clears throat> And all this is traced back to the saints' suffering for the sake of righteousness. <clears throat> Jesus Christ, the righteous, suffered for our sins, but because he was sinless himself, he was quickened by the Spirit. How do we know he was quickened? By what he accomplished. <clears throat> <clears throat> but now that's not all that Jesus has to say about, uh, part, I'm sorry, Peter has to say about Jesus' resurrection. His suffering doesn't end with, and Jesus rose from the dead, and they all lived happily ever after. It doesn't end there. Now we get to my text. Not only was he quickened, but he was exalted as a result of his suffering. Who is gone into heaven, and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Now that's quite a quickening. From the grave 
to the right hand of God. Consider that this one at the right hand of God was once a dead man, was once a dead man, the seed of the woman. This is the one that bruised the serpent's head. <clears throat> now there's a couple of questions here I want to answer in my message this evening. <clears throat> That first is, why does Peter mention this in this context? Why, why doesn't he just say that he's now gone into heaven and he's on the right hand of the Father? Why, why doesn't he just leave it there? But he adds this on to it, that angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. <clears throat> well, for one, one thing that Peter is showing us here is that reward was given him for his suffering because he suffered for well-doing and God is a rewarder and he's a recompenser he will recompense trouble to them that trouble you and he'll reward you for your suffering for his namesake you can count on that <clears throat> who will render unto every man according to his deeds to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality eternal life and two speaking of Jesus being in heaven with angels, authorities, and powers made subject unto him in the context of suffering also indicates to us the intercession and power of Jesus on your behalf. And as you suffer for him, he's not in a powerless position. He's in a position to, to aid you in every way in your suffering for his name's sake. Amen. There he sits enthroned in our long home managing all our trials. All our enemies are subject to our Lord. There he is strengthening us, encouraging us, and waiting us for to, to join him in his throne after we have suffered a little while. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. But now another question we want to answer is, is why did Peter bring this up? Is it a new thing? <clears throat> is having angels, authorities, and powers subject to Jesus? Is this really new? Well, in a way, no, it's not. <clears throat> Angels and authorities and th authorities and powers have always been subject to Jesus. Even while he walked this earth, they were subject unto him. He arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? He already, already knew who it was, and he had a lot of information about his future. <clears throat> I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, said, Hold thy peace. Come out of him. And how about that gathering demoniac? When he saw Jesus afar off, he ran away. No, he ran and worshipped him. He, this man, was, he's motivated by the legion of demons in his body. He ran and worshipped him. It's like, there's Jesus, we got a report. He ran and worshipped him, <clears throat> cried with a loud voice, saying, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. And you know, in the Garden of Gethsemane there, he told Peter to put away his sword. He said, I could pre my father, if I pray to him, he'll presently give me more than 12 legions of angels. This is all at my disposal now, Peter. <clears throat> and you know, when they came to arrest him, they asked, which one of you is Jesus? He says, I am he, and they all fell over backward. So he, he had this power when he was here on earth. So if this is not something new, why does Peter bother to mention this in this text? <clears throat> In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. <clears throat> Angels, authorities, and powers have been subject to him ever since he made them. There was never a time when they ceased to be subject to him. Even in his death he made it clear he was laying down his life, and that no man could take it from him. <clears throat> And another question, which angels, authorities, and powers is Peter speaking of in this text? Or does it really matter? We could say that this is speaking of all angels and all authorities and all powers, whether holy or unholy. And that is true. That certainly is true. 
but that's too easy, and I don't think that's the point that Peter is making. Now, an angel <clears throat> is a messenger or a minister or a servant. God has angels, and at least two places of Scripture, Satan is said to have angels, both in Revelation chapter 12, the dragon fought and his angels. And he, verse 9, he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And you know, there are both holy authorities and unholy authorities. The dragon gave him his power and his seat in great authority. And we're told to pray for kings and all that are in authority. And the same is true for powers. There are spiritual powers that are holy, and there are spiritual powers that are unholy. There are even spiritual powers that we might call nature. Wind and waves and stars and planets, <clears throat> everything in heaven and in earth. <clears throat> there are worldly powers, political, social, business, and etc., all driven by spiritual powers. And all these have been made subject to Jesus. <clears throat> And we know that holy angels, authorities and powers, are subject unto Christ, but it's very little comfort to know that they're subject to Christ, but that perhaps the others are not. <clears throat> now this is Peter's point. <clears throat> For the answer to the question, we simply look at the context, <clears throat> which is suffering at the hands of wicked men, suffering for well-doing. <clears throat> Jesus said as he was about to be crucified, this is your hour and the power of darkness. Now there were, it was wicked men that crucified Jesus, but they were also being motivated by wicked authorities and powers. <clears throat> Satan had been given leave to do his worst in Jesus, and he desired to sift Peter, and he entered into Judas. <clears throat> the one that these evil powers tried to remove was the one that God exalted over them. God exalted a man, a man whom the wicked powers and authorities tried to destroy, and not just any man, but a dead man, a man who was the propitiation for the sins of the world, and who was once cursed of God. From the grave to the throne of the majesty in the heavens, God exalted his man to reign over these evil authorities and powers. Now that is something new. All angels, all powers, all authorities have been made subject to him, but within the context of 1 Peter, it is especially those wicked authorities and powers that, they, that thought they had gotten the victory over the Son of Man. The ones who once tempted him and were the instigators of his suffering have now been made subject to him by reason of marvelous and open conquest of them. It's, it is indeed a new thing that Peter tells us about, that these authorities and powers are made subject to an exalted man now. Job could tell us this is indeed a new thing. It's not the word that was in the beginning that Peter is speaking of, but the exalted Christ. <clears throat> it is not God alone to whom angels and authorities and powers are being made subject, but the God-man. It is Jesus, God with us, the Son of Man, to whom all are subject. It is our Savior and our great High Priest. It is our one mediator between God and man and the great shepherd of the sheep, the Lord's Christ, the Lamb that was slain, to whom angels, authorities, and powers are being made subject. Now, as some have already noted, he is the same person, and yet, in a sense, he is a different person because of his experience. <clears throat> Who was in who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Another place says in the likeness of sinful flesh. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto the death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God hath also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. He is now specially equipped, you might say, to manage angels, authorities, and powers for the sole purpose of saving men and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. He is an exalted man reigning from heaven, not from earth. Heaven is the superior place. <clears throat> 
Is it possible for someone to reign in heaven and not reign on the earth? Jesus reigns from the superior place where the superior persons reside, the place from whence all things have come. <clears throat> He's in the control room, you might say. Heaven is the place from which the universe was created. It's the place <clears throat> that all these angels, authorities, and powers must report to. Heaven is the place from which the devil and his angels were cast out. The Holy Ghost was sent down from heaven. And when heaven's opened up unto you, you'll see the angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. No one ever said, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of heaven. No one ever said that. That's because it's the superior place where the throne of God is, and the Son of Man reigns over all from there. Persons and powers that are far superior to us are not superior to our shepherd. They have been made subject to him, and they are made subject to the captain of our salvation. So how can they possibly hurt us? The angels are working for our bridegroom. The devil and his angels are working for him. The Holy Spirit has been sent into our hearts by him. All persons of authority in heaven and earth are working for him. All power is in his power, as the scripture saith, all power belongeth unto him. Not only can evil not harm you, but those who can help you have Jesus' orders to do so. These words, the most important words, I think, in this text are being made subject. <clears throat> the principalities and powers that previously were inherently subject to Christ, subject to the word in the beginning, <clears throat> are now being made subject to the exalted man, Christ Jesus. When he overcame them, he prevailed over them. He destroyed them. He spoiled and triumphed openly over them. <clears throat> they are made subject unto him. Being made is another, was, another way of saying that the more superior power and authority was made known. Jesus triumphed over all other authorities and powers. They were made, that is, they were made by force, by the overt display of superiority, without recourse. They were made subject to him. When Jesus destroyed the devil and spoiled wicked principalities and powers and ascended up on high, then they knew their time was short. When they saw the seed of the woman, an exalted man, ascend to the right hand of God, they knew their time was short then. It won't be long before the end is complete. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Hitherto is the end of the matter. And they were made subject to him. Kind of like the creature, or the creation, was made subject to vanity, not willingly. I think that's a fair trade, isn't it? Here the, the, the perfect and sinless creation was made subject to vanity. I think wicked principalities and powers and authorities ought to be made subject to our Lord. Yes. Not willingly. Yes. Subject to him. Now subject means more than just under him. <clears throat> Angels and authorities and powers are subject. Like the demons were subject to him while he walked the earth. <clears throat> Subject means accountable, <clears throat> subservient, liable to, dependent, being under the power of or dominion of, obedient to. When we hear this text, what's so edifying to us now again is that this is, this is one of us that they have been made subject to. This is our Lord and the Christ that they've been made subject unto. Do, unto. <clears throat> it's the fact of who Jesus is the exalted Christ that makes this unusual. <clears throat> and this is Peter's point in saying these things, that they've been made subject to this once suffering man. Now if you consider these things, this will almost want to make you get up and shout, bring on the suffering! <laughs> right? Almost. <laughs> but this is, this is your end now. All those that live godly in the world will suffer persecution. For God's purpose in Christ, they are made subject to him. The one who has been given to be head over all things to the church, they've been made subject to him. 
the one who is now filling all things, has angels and authorities and powers subject unto him. The one who is exalted to be a prince and a savior, they're subject to him. The one now appearing in the presence of God for us, they're made subject to him. <clears throat> the one who provides a way of escape from every temptation has angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. Being subject to him means his will prevails over all others. It means there's no argument or battle between Jesus and anyone, not ever. It means that angels, authorities, and powers always do what Jesus wants them to do. They have no other choice. They are made subject unto him, made by necessity, made by force, made by Christ's all superiority, made by defeat, made by being creatures of their creator. They are made subject to Jesus. Well then, brethren, what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. I want to close with some exhortations from this first epistle of Peter, again in this context of suffering for well-doing. But rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. And humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. <clears throat>